Recently, there have been reports about how some airlines have been literally trying to steal leased jets from each other. Is this a sign that we're actually starting to run out of aircraft? And if that's the case, why is that happening? And can we fix it? Stay tuned. We all know that the aviation industry is incredibly cyclical, with violent swings between good and bad times. Often, this is triggered by external economical upsets, and the pandemic was of course the probably most recent and extreme example of this, at least in peacetime. But like I said, that was far from the first time that the industry insiders carefully prepared market preparations and trends, then went completely out of the window after something unexpected happened. But what I want to talk about today is a relatively new type of crisis, something that has been brewing for a while in the aftermath of the pandemic, but in reality had started forming well before 2020 and is now getting more and more serious. And I'll start with a couple of interesting examples of effects that this crisis is already bringing us. Just over a year ago, an ultra-low-cost carrier in Canada called Flair Airlines had to make an embarrassing apology to its customers after they had cancelled several flights in the last minute. And the reason? Well, the reason was that a group of lessers had just seized four of their aircraft, one Boeing 737-800 and three 737 MAX 8s. The airline later sued those lessers, and a few months after that, the lessers sued one of Flair's investors for missing or late aircraft lease payments. Now, from the start, Flair admitted that they were indeed late on some of their payments for their lessers to the tune of about $1 million or so. Now, the lessers later disputed that amount, saying that it was many, many times more than that, but Flair curiously also alleged that the repossessions were made not so much because of the late payment, but instead because the lessers had found new and better deals for the planes with other airlines. Now, this isn't an unprecedented event, and I'm not going to comment on the specifics of this case, except to say that repossessions are situations that airlines and lessers normally do their absolute best to try and avoid. Nobody likes going for the nuclear option if friendlier solutions are available, which they tend to be. For example, during the pandemic, when airlines obviously couldn't fly anywhere and therefore made basically no money, lessers had to be more patient, and by all accounts, it looks like they actually were. A survey showed that 86% of the leasing companies out there agreed to defer aircraft lease payments during those times, which obviously makes sense since neither side would benefit from wholesale repossessions at a time when nobody could fly. So the key detail to focus on in the Flair Airlines story is that those repossessions took place early in March 2023. So based on that timing, you might think that, well, since the worst of the pandemic was behind us by then and travel was picking up nicely, it probably made sense for the lessers to gradually have less and less patience with late payments, right? Well, that is probably true, but it's far from the whole story here. And that brings me to my second and most recent example involving Gol and Latam Airlines in South America. Now, to understand just how crazy this story is, you need to know that LATAM operates a single-aisle aircraft fleet of only the Airbus A320 family, both legacy models and NEOs. And Gol, in Brazil, are an only Boeing 737 airline, operating NGs and Maxes, and unfortunately for Gol, they had a quite difficult start of 2024. Late in January, the airline actually filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection, which allowed them to continue operating whilst restructuring their debts, under the supervision of a court based in New York City. Now, without getting too technical here, the Chapter 11 process keeps debtors from trying to seize a company's assets, which is obviously important if the company wants to be able to continue operating. But just one day after Gold's Chapter 11 process was announced, something pretty strange happened. Latam Airlines reportedly contacted several lessers on that very same day, telling them that they would happily take over any leases of Boeing 737 aircraft that might become available. And they did that even though they currently had an all Airbus single aisle fleet. And that's not all that they did. Latam, who operates mainly in Chile and Brazil, also started posting ads for pilots in Brazil who were already typerated on the 737. And according to Gol, they also contacted several travel agents who were working together with Gol, allegedly trying to persuade them to stop doing that. 
Now, the New York judge, who, remember, was supposed to be protecting the airline during the Chapter 11 process, wasn't very impressed by this at all. And sure enough, a lawyer for LATAM later admitted to the judge that the letter the airline had sent to those lessers a day after Gold's Chapter 11 bankruptcy was not purely a coincidence. But LATAM's team also explained something very relevant to the topic of this video. They just really, really needed to find airplanes at the time. They were already working with some of the same lessers as Gaul, and right then, they just desperately needed aircraft wherever they could find them, so to steal them away from a competitor in trouble didn't look like such a bad idea. And by the way, LATAM themselves had gone through that same Chapter 11 bankruptcy and restructuring at the height of the pandemic in 2020, completing the process about two and a half years later. But the fact that LATAM needed aircraft so badly that they were willing to commit to an entirely new aircraft type and also risk annoying an American judge by, let's say, testing the limits of some international rules, says something about how desperate things have started to become. So, why is this happening? What's going on with the supply of aircraft that makes both airlines and lessers do these kind of things in the first place? Well, to understand that, we need to start by looking at a combination of different events in recent years who have all worked together to cause this perfect storm. And I will do all of that after this. Whilst airlines have to navigate shortages and legal issues, we all face potentially similar issues but with our online security. And that's where today's sponsor, NordVPN, steps in. Nord supplies tools that my team and I use all the time to both ensure our online security and also get access to crucial research information. You see, by routing your connection through different countries, you can unlock access to your favorite content when you're out traveling, but also score exclusive discounts on things like flights, rental cars and hotels. But lately, Nord has grown beyond just their VPN services. They're now a complete all-in-one defense against online threats like malware, intrusive ads, and even phishing attempts. So if you want access to these fantastic tools, then use the link here below, which is nordvpn.com slash mentornow to get four free months when you sign up for the two-year deal. And remember, you can test it completely risk-free for up to 30 days, since Nord always gives you a full refund within that time if they fall short of your expectations. Thank you, Nord. Now back to the video. It wasn't that long ago that the airline industry was literally overflowing with aircraft, or at least certain types of them. Those included the 737NG, the Legacy A320 family, plus Embraer 190s and 195s, along with wide bodies like the Airbus A330 and the Boeing 767. Back then, all signs were pointing to the fact that these jets just weren't in demand anymore. Now, this happened in the pandemic, but it definitely wasn't the pandemic itself that had actually caused it. The pandemic accelerated it, as it did with many, many other things, but in many ways it was inevitable anyway, because of what had happened during the previous decade. So, what was that then? Well, the 2010s had been an incredibly hectic period for both aircraft manufacturers and airlines, since everyone had started either replacing or updating nearly every aircraft type that they had. And to explain what I mean by that, let's look at a couple of timelines. The entry into service date of the Airbus A320neo family was near the middle of the 2010s, January 2016 for the Airbus A320neo and May the following year for the bigger and more popular Airbus A321neo. The 737 MAX family followed close at the heels of the Airbus, with the MAX 8 starting to fly passengers in May 2017, and with the larger MAX 9 following just under a year after that. And together, those two aircraft families makes up the vast majority of airliners out there, but this refleeting goes beyond just the narrow bodies. We also had new types like the Airbus A330neo, who entered service in December of 2018, and before that, Boeing's 787-8, the smallest member of the 787 family, who entered service late back in 2011. Now that aircraft had quite a few problems at first, which is why the larger 787-9 didn't come online until August of 2014. Finally, the Airbus A350 came into play in 2015, and of course all of the dates that I just mentioned only represent the first delivery and service entry for each type. In reality, it takes months or even years for deliveries of a new type to pick up pace, even if everything goes smoothly in the beginning. 
And in the case of the 787, for example, that did not happen. With smoking lithium batteries and engine issues from the very start, keeping Boeing and its airline customers very busy and frustrated for years. Meanwhile, older aircraft like the Boeing 777-300ER went out of production in 2020 and was replaced slowly by types like the Airbus A350-1000. The 777X was supposed to enter service around the same time, but as I've explained in many of my other videos, that now won't happen until earliest 2025. But back to our story. In 2019, then came the grounding of the Boeing 737 MAX family after two devastating accidents in 2018 and 2019. Now, I will eventually cover those accidents over on the Mentor Pilot channel, but for today's topic, a key detail here is that before the grounding, Boeing was producing 52 Maxes every month. Immediately after the grounding, Boeing believed that the plane would be returned to service relatively quickly, so they actually kept making around 42 of them per month for quite a while. But it soon became clear that a quick return was out of the question, and once that was realized, production was completely stopped for a while, and then resumed at a much slower pace. Of course, Airbus was completely unaffected by the MAX crisis, but they were not unaffected by the pandemic, which kicked in about one year later. Now, I don't think that I need to explain to you guys why the demand for new aircraft basically went down to zero during the pandemic, but never mind new aircraft. What about the old Airbus and Boeing aircraft that were getting replaced? Normally, they would find other users and roles, but when the pandemic hit, what do you think happened to them? Well, predictably, the value of a lot of those older aircraft just evaporated basically overnight. Now, even if there had been no pandemic, a lot of airlines and lessers would have struggled to find new uses for them anyway. But the pandemic obviously made this trend even stronger, and that was a big problem. You see, under normal circumstances, airlines have to look after their aircraft because their resale value when they're replaced forms a big part of how airlines remain profitable. And the same obviously also goes for lessers, who right now own over half of the world's commercial aircraft. So with the resale value now dropping like a rock, this affected the airline's balance sheets very, very badly and immediately. So getting rid of them and their maintenance costs became a big priority. But even with that in mind, the low utilization of passenger aircraft during the pandemic meant that there were suddenly a huge aircraft surplus. And while most affected aircraft were older models, many of them were still relatively new, which caused some quite unusual things to happen. In September of 2021, Scott Hamilton in Leham News reported that an Airbus A330-300 had been converted into a freighter. Now that in itself wasn't very strange, but what made this specific conversion very special was the fact that the jet was less than 8 years old. That's less than half the age of most aircraft who are being converted into cargo, and that just showed how much these aircraft had depreciated. This was of course especially true in 2021, when long-haul travel was still a long way from recovering, but freight prices were still sky high. The pandemic famously became an opportunity for cargo airlines to refresh their fleets with newer and more efficient models. But it wasn't just cargo that benefited from this odd circumstance. This aircraft surplus in the industry also meant that the leasing prices of these aircraft suddenly dropped, and the availability of cheap to rent jets was an opportunity for new airline startups to suddenly emerge, which included examples like Avelo Air and Breeze in the United States. Some regular airlines also saw an opportunity in using these cheap leasing aircraft to expand their fleets, which is exactly what Flair in Canada had done in 2021, a couple of years before its issues started with their lessers. In Europe, Norwegian Air Shuttle was also able to restructure their debt and recover from hard times, in part thanks to the sudden availability of cheap aircraft. Now, not all startups and expansions went well during the pandemic. We saw Flair's issues with their leased jets eventually, and others like Flyr in Norway only lasted about a year and a half. Then we had Flypop, a low-cost long-haul startup who didn't even really get off the ground beyond just a few cargo flights. But all this cheap aircraft bonanza happened between 2021 and the beginning of 2023. Gradually after that, the air travel recovery really started accelerating, and the aircraft demand issue was then obviously reversed. 
That happened first to short and medium haul operations, but then eventually also for long haul, especially during the second half of 2023. Now, this obviously meant that those older aircraft were suddenly becoming more desirable again, which up until then had been far from certain. But as the industry now started to pick up and the demand started picking up with that, had the production of new aircraft recovered in the same time? No, it had not. New aircraft production had not come even close to recovering. Even before the FAA capped Boeing's 737 monthly output to 38 aircraft earlier this year, Boeing could barely hit that production rate, which was still a far cry from the 52 737s that they had made monthly until the 2019 grounding. And Airbus? Well, in 2023, they had a record year in new aircraft orders and also delivered 735 jets to their customers, which was a pandemic-era record. But in contrast, back in 2019, Airbus had actually delivered 863 aircraft, meaning that they were now nowhere near the pre-pandemic production. The years of the pandemic, plus the extra year of slow 77 MAX production during the grounding, plus the problems that Pratt & Whitney had with some of their Airbus A320neo engines, plus other teething problems in the production of the CFM Leap engines, was now causing a significant shortfall of single-aisle aircraft, and things were just getting worse. On top of all of this, wide-body production wasn't doing great either. Deliveries of the 787 had actually stopped for an even longer period than the MAX, and its production rate still remains low to this day. And since, in the early stages of the pandemic, several airlines decided to retire entire aircraft types early to try and keep their costs low, this now made the current aircraft shortage even worse. The end result of all of this is that we are right now dealing with an airline industry that is around 3,000 aircraft short of what the airlines and lessers were planning with for the pandemic for this year. Gaul, the airline in Brazil that is going through Chapter 11 bankruptcy, has actually cited the lack of 737 MAX deliveries as one of the reasons for their issues, since they were planning with access to those aircraft in order to run their business. And LATAM's probes to see if gold 737s would be available and their ads for 737 pilots are also not unique. This is actually very similar to what happened in India last September between a startup called Akasa Air and Air India. Several Akasa Air pilots reportedly resigned en masse to go and work for Air India instead, upsetting Akasa's flight schedules. And what this all seems to point at is that we're now lacking both pilots and aircraft everywhere. And speaking of pilots, all this actually helps answer a question that some of you have been asking lately. What about that pilot shortage that you made such a big deal about a few videos back? Where is it? Well. Lately, we have actually received news of several airlines in the United States stopping their pilot hiring. So, does that mean that the pilot shortage is over? Well, no. The airlines still need thousands of new pilots only to replace the retiring ones. And on top of that, they also need to fill the cockpits of the aircraft that they have on order. But since those ordered aircraft are not arriving, it means that there are currently no aircraft for these new pilots to fly. So since the airlines now need both pilots and aircraft, it makes very little sense to get one without the other, which is why they're now holding recruitment. So what does this all mean then? What's next? Can we expect this situation to improve or is there more trouble ahead? Well. Obviously, the most recent 737 MAX problems and the scrutiny that Boeing now finds itself in seems to indicate that we can't really expect a production ramp up from their side anytime soon. And on top of that, the delayed certification of the 737 MAX-7 and the MAX-10 is already forcing airlines like United to make alternative plans for their expansions. As for Airbus, checks on early Airbus A320neos with geared turbofan engines looks set to continue for many more months, potentially meaning even further delays there. And their Airbus A321XLR is also behind schedule, although it hasn't faced the kind of multi-year delays that we've seen with Boeing's remaining MAX variants. But even if Airbus keeps up their production, they won't really be able to satisfy the entire world's demand fast enough. And we can see that by looking at their order books, where new aircraft orders are now being scheduled for delivery well into the 2030s. So what can the airlines actually do about all of this then? 
Well, in the short term, the airlines can lease small numbers of aircraft and pilots from ACMI airline operators, meaning wet leasing both crews and aircraft from airlines specialized in fulfilling exactly that role. But this isn't really a cost-effective nor a viable long-term solution, since the number of available ACMI operators and aircraft are quite low. But if you tend to have one of those airlines, congrats. Another alternative is to go out to the desert, where some older aircraft are sitting in storage and try to return those to service. But this can be very time consuming and extremely costly, especially if the planes need lengthy and expensive overhaul, which they almost certainly will. No, unfortunately for all of us, the one thing that the airlines can do that can help them both deal with a lack of aircraft and the lack of pilots is to increase ticket prices. The rules of supply and demand are simple. When there isn't enough supply, the prices goes up. And a lack of aircraft makes existing aircraft pricier. And the same happens when there's a lack of available routes because of a lack of aircraft. And in a lot of markets, reducing routes and capacity is something that the airlines have already started doing. Again, reducing supply. Now the ticket prices have been steadily decreasing over the last couple of decades, but this changed after the pandemic and all indications point to them just continuing to become more and more expensive during the coming years. This becomes even more true if you consider that beyond all of the issues that I've laid out in this video, there is also a need to fund future technology like sustainable aviation fuels and new infrastructure for things like hydrogen. This will undoubtedly push the ticket prices up even higher. But what do you think? As always, I would love to hear from you and see if you agree or not. Go down, leave a comment and leave a like if you think that I've earned it. Also, check out these videos next. And if you want to help me improve the channels and join our awesome Hangouts, consider joining my fantastic Patreon crew. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.